I'm not going to give much of an opening statement, but I do think maybe a, a couple key points to, to make up front. Um, we, after a lot of you know considerations throughout the entire offseason, we made the proactive decision uh, to ensure that public health, uh, particularly at the federal level, could maintain focus on the most important priorities um, and that circumstances and situation had not changed enough to warrant us making a formal uh, ask for the Blue Jays to begin their season in Toronto. Uh, this also uh, took into consideration our experiences last year and the effort to provide our players uh, with some peace of mind and certainty, uh, at least as to how we'll start our season. So uh, it doesn't diminish uh, from our desire to be uh, in Canada and in Toronto, uh, but I think it acknowledges uh, that that's not just a realistic possibility right now with uh, the circumstances being what they are and the border obviously still being closed. So uh, certainly a lot more detail to provide, um, but I feel like it's best to probably give that to you through a Q&A format. So we'll turn it over to questions now and, and happy to answer any questions that you've got. Okay, if you have any question, you can raise your hand. Uh, we can do that through the participants window. That's at the bottom of your screen. If you click there, you can raise hand and we'll queue things up that way. Uh, some versions also has reactions down there. So if you just look for raise a hand, um, that'll be the way to go. And then we'll get started. Our first question comes from Ben Nicholson Smith. Hey, Mark. Uh, thanks for the time. Okay. Yeah. So to clarify, you guys didn't make a formal ask. You kind of proactively said you'll start in Dunedin. That's correct. Okay. Um, and obviously last year when you guys were playing in Buffalo, there were a lot of modifications that, that you guys made in a very short period of time. Now there's more lead up time. What sorts of, of changes will you have to make to accommodate for the visiting team to make it safe and kind of playable for the Blue Jays? What, what kind of projects are underway on that front? In, in, at TD Ballpark here in Dunedin or in Buffalo, Ben? Uh, in in uh, Dunedin, Florida, not Buffalo. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, a lot of the the changes that we'll make here are similar to how we attacked, you know, the Buffalo circumstance, which is we're using the same company to support us, BAM Productions. Um, you know, ensuring that we can adhere to the protocols uh, that MLB has in place. So that's you know, providing bigger spaces, temporary spaces are going to need to be put in place for the visiting team. What we've got there now is just just too small. Uh, remain, remains to be seen how we utilize the home side, but we'll certainly provide additional spacing there. Uh, I think we're going to play off of our players and our coaching staff as to whether they maintain a primary presence here at the player development complex and just go over and kind of temporarily house there and play the games uh, or whether they want to work out of there, you know, more like it's a traditional home ballpark, but spacing, outdoor dining, um, you know, very similar to what we had to do for the visiting side, you know, will be the way we approach uh, setting up TD Ballpark. Makes sense. Okay, next we'll go to Mike Harrington. And just a reminder, we'll do one question and one follow-up if you have it. Go ahead, Morning, Mark. Hi, Mike. Um, just a quick initial question. Can we assume because of the weather, the heat and such, Dunedin is not an option for the entire season? Um, I think that's safe to say. I think, you know, in, with all candor, we're kind of looking at um, the circumstance uh, that the, the, the alternatives for our season lie in some combination of Dunedin, Buffalo, and Toronto. Uh, that, was not, that is not without a lot of consideration of over 30 minor league facilities, former major league facilities, you know, the consideration of being a second major league team. We had an, ex an off season where we spent a ton of time examining every alternative from travel, uh, climate, um, you know, playing facilities, maybe most important ability to execute and implement protocol. We ended up back kind of, you know, where we were last year, which is Buffalo does present uh, both the most familiar and the best alternative for us playing in the AL East with the space that we need. But Mike, there's two considerations for Buffalo and that's one, the weather and two, you know, what we did last year was very temporary and is really no longer available to us. Uh, and what we need to do to have Buffalo be playable this year is, is hopefully provide a more lasting and permanent solution that our AAA players can benefit from and the Buffalo uh, team can benefit from moving forward. Uh, so we're beginning to work on those things now. Um, things like moving the bullpens off the field, providing a better 
uh, longer term uh, batting facility, but some of the same challenges that we had in Buffalo, which is if we sell tickets there this year, we no longer can can have a weight room on the concourse, you know, right by concession stands or batting cages on the concourse. You know, we had to find other places, you know, for that infrastructure and for those facilities. Those were the same limiting factors in other major league facilities. There just wasn't space for us when you take away concourse, as most teams expect to be selling some level of tickets this year. And just a quick follow-up, I mean, I know I'm playing scenarios here, but if you ended up in Buffalo, is it even possible to share the ballpark with a AAA team or the AAA team would have to kind of barnstorm? The AAA team wouldn't barnstorm. We'd find a different home for this AAA team, something we're already working on. I'm not prepared to kind of say what that is yet, but um, we're we're not going to just, you know, kick the AAA team to the street. We've worked with you know, Mike Buchkowski and the, and the Buffalo Bisons uh, to think very carefully. That's that's our Triple A team, so we certainly want them to be in the best situation possible. And if if we end up moving to Buffalo at some point during the season, um, we'll find a a very good home for our Triple A team as well. Thank you. Okay, next we go to Caitlin. Hey, Mark. Um, thanks for this. Hi, Caitlin. Sure. For this, this decision for Dunedin, you kind of mentioned you made it proactively. Um, was this also something that the players were interested in? How much input did they have in this decision to uh, just remain in Dunedin to start the season? Yeah, I'd, I'd say maybe a little bit less input and more informed. It's tough for the players to consider all the alternatives that exist out there. Um, Ross does a great job of keeping both our staff and players informed and getting an understanding of what their concerns might be. Some of the changes we're going to make to, to Dunedin as well are just going to be suitable places for their families to watch the game and ensuring that we're, we're taking care of them. But I, I guess what I'd say, Caitlin, is first and foremost, the peace of mind for our players after having gone through a situation last year where we just didn't know where we were going to be and they couldn't plan both for themselves and their families um, so, so maybe a little bit less about, you know, where, what alternatives lie out there and more about how can we satisfy your ability to plan both for yourselves and your families. And just, you guys have decided that the first two homestands for sure will be to need in, um, and then you'll reassess from there. What will you need to see happen for you to start making that formal request um, with the government? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the things that are most obvious to all of us, which is simply, you know, what are the uh, positive test rates? What are the, you know, what does the access to the vaccine, uh, the distribution of the vaccine, have our players uh, and, you know, other major league players been vaccinated? Um, all the variables that, you know, lead to having it be a, a safer, you know, healthier uh, environment and ensuring that, you know, uh, our players playing in Toronto is, is no greater risk you know, to Canadians and, and to the, you know, to the Toronto, um, you know, public health system. Those are the things that we'll look at. Um, safety, I guess, first and foremost. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Laura. Hey, Mark, thanks for doing this. Um, Hi, are you able to say at this point what you think the likelihood is that you will be back in Toronto at some point this season? I wish I could, Laura. You know, I think that uh, like all of us, we we watch the news, we talk to the people we know that have access to information. Um, what's what's what I can say with complete certainty is that's where we want to be. Um, what I can also say, you know, with with confidence, is that we're not going to push the issue if we don't think it can be done safely with a combination of very stringent Major League Baseball protocols. A reminder that we had. You know, didn't have any positive tests last year once the season started because our players were so respectful, you know, of the protocols and public health and safety. Um, so some combination of that, along with uh, improving conditions, um, you know, both here uh, and back at home. So um, I think we'll all be watching the same things. It's going to be clear to all of us whether the circumstances, you know, present uh, a, a meaningful and healthy case for us to get back home. That's where we want to be. Uh, we hope to get there. And I think we'll all be able to gauge whether or not, you know, that's a possibility. At this point, you're able to sell a certain number of tickets to TD ballpark. If there was a scenario where you could return to Toronto, but you weren't able to sell tickets, would that still be something that you would be willing to do? Absolutely. The, the, you know, the tickets we're selling in Toronto 
are not meaningful revenue. It's just to provide an atmosphere for our players that's a little more positive and supportive. Um, you know, at this point, ticket revenue is not a consideration or a factor. It's more about getting home and getting, you know, to back on the soil and turf, you know, that, that, uh, gives us the best chance to win. And again, I think I, I didn't, haven't said that that's probably, you know, a very important, you know, consideration that we're making every step of the way. It is a positive environment for our players, but most importantly, it's the environment that allows us to have the best chance to win. Thanks, Mark. Go ahead, Scott. Hey Mark, thanks for the time. Um, when you go through your, your planning scenarios um, for what could project in, into the future, um, what, what is the timeline that you guys have for when the border reopens, if it reopens, how quickly could you mobilize from say, you know, playing in Dunedin to getting up back here to Toronto? We could mobilize pretty quickly. I mean, I think it's a matter of kind of looking from one homestand to the next. Moving to Toronto is the easiest move for us. Um, the work that we have to be that has to be done for us to consider a, an interim move or a second move to Buffalo is probably you know much more uh, intensive and and you know a, a bigger infrastructure challenge you know for us to think about you know getting to Buffalo. So the reason why we use the date of May second because that's the first even possible date. So I think you know we'll set aside anything at some point. I would imagine long before you know, May 2nd, we'll consider whether it's May 14th, you know, before the, the, the you know, the third homestand or June 1st before the fourth homestand. Uh, we'll always stay in front of it, you know, probably a month at a time and we'll always be working to ensure. Uh, but the but the move to Toronto logistically is an easy one, particularly without fans, because it's everything is there. We just need to ensure the protocol from training camp is back up and, and in place and that we consider a, a visiting team as well. And then I remember asking you this last year about the ballpark, how you expected it to play. I don't think anyone, you know, thought of those jet streams, but uh, any idea, and you obviously have a huge sample size of, of major leaguers being in that park in, in February and March, but how do you expect it to play uh, this year? Yeah, it's clearly going to be, you know, a hitter friendly ballpark um, until you start playing regular season, major league baseball games, which are very different than spring training games as far as, utilizing game plans and the way pitchers attack hitters and the way we defense, all those things are very different regular season from the way, you know, every team approaches spring training. So there are some unknowns, uh, but certainly, you know, it's going to be left-handed hitter friendly and it's going to be a smaller ballpark. So it's going to be hitter friendly. So um, I, I always, you know, that's for both teams, not just, you know, for us or for the visiting team. So uh, whatever ballpark attributes it has will be present for both teams. It's not going to be one that, we can plan for or another team can plan for because we're just not going to be playing major league games out of there long enough for that to be an issue. Okay. Thank you. Next up is Mark Topkin. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. Um, you alluded to maybe some changes you'll have to make at TD Ballpark. What were some of the other accommodations you, you've had to make with the, the city, uh, with the Rays, with the facility itself? Um, some of those type of changes or arrangements? Yeah, the city and the county and the state obviously have been incredibly supportive and, and, uh, and I think it's a, it's going to be historic and maybe fun for the city of Dunedin to have major league baseball play there. Something no one ever considered happening. Uh, the Rays were one of our first phone call and, you know, uh, longstanding good relationship with both, you know, Stu Sternberg and Matt Silverman and, um, wanted to ensure that we were respectful, that it is clearly their territory. We didn't plan on having a long-term presence, uh, but that any presence that we had there was only there, Mark, and necessitated because of a crisis and a pandemic that is outside of our control. And uh, they've been incredibly supportive. That has, you know, and, um, you know, we've tried to be respectful as well to understand that we're not trying to take their fans and we're not trying to, you know, uh, stake a, a claim to, to, to this territory and this area beyond it being our spring and, and our training home. And that's what we hope it continues to be. Right. And what, uh, I know you did the lights last year. What other changes do you see uh, being uh, ne necessary? And you said, maybe you guys would, I know you said you might do your pregame stuff at the facility and just us over, but what other things have to change, especially with having uh, probably about a thousand fans, it would look like if I'm doing my math right. Yeah, that's about right. We listen, the lighting is still an issue because although we replaced the lights last year and, and it's among the best 
level of minor league lighting, the, the height of the light stands is still an issue. So balls can be lost above that. It is certainly not, you know, uh, a, a typical major league lighting scenario. So we're going to bring in four extra light towers to supplement that and hope, you know, that gets it up to par. The field is top notch. We'd already replaced the dugouts. The dugouts are major league quality dugouts at this point. Um, the bullpens are major league quality bullpens. We've got, you know, good batting facilities and they're all outdoors. So it really is, you know, uh, weight room, cardiovascular, you know, equipment, uh, locker facilities for the visiting team, less the home team lighting, you know, those are really our biggest issues. And then as far as the fans go, um, you know, we'll be selling tickets in a way that is safe, you know, with, with social distancing, uh, with masks, you know, in pods, you know, things that, you know, create a safe, uh, but still positive environment. Thank you. Go back to Ben. Hey, Mark. So outside looking in, uh, Vancouver would seem to be in somewhat of a similar situation just with the border and they're in a, a different spot being a full season affiliate this year for you guys. What are some of the uh, considerations that go into uh, making that season as safe as possible for the Vancouver team? Yeah, just that we can't play in Vancouver, Ben, and we're still working through that. So I don't really have much more to say about that right now, but it's obvious that the same limiting factors in, in Toronto would limit us from playing in Vancouver as well. Right. And then just kind of big picture as you guys, you know, obviously start spring training today, the off season's over. What's your uh, kind of, how do you assess the off season that, that you guys had and uh, where you are as you open training camp? Ah, a, a non, non facility related question. <clears throat> I mean, listen, there's, a tremendous amount of positive energy and optimism around the team, um, which is great. You know, I think we, we were determined to kind of take the success, uh, the belief that our players had in each other and in their ability last year that transpired into a very positive step forward and continue to maintain that momentum and, and move this team, um, you know, another step closer towards a sustainable championship caliber team. Um, the, I think just the natural progress of our young players, which will always be the core of what we do, the progress of our player development system, will, which will continue to supplement, support, uh, and provide depth, you know, for us. Um, and then the additions of some exciting outside players like George Springer, Marcus Semien, you know, Tyler Yates, David Phelps, so many others, you know, they're, they're going to continue uh, to, to add to you know, the progress that we've made. So uh, by far, you know, we don't feel it's a perfect team. We know we're going to have to continue to make additions and improve. The, there will be other opportunities to do that, the trade deadline next off season. Uh, but we feel like we're on course, Ben. I think that's probably the best summary. We are on course in our plan to build a sustainable championship team. Right. Thanks. Okay, your turn, Laura. Hey Mark, just to follow up quickly on a question Caitlin asked earlier, um, you mentioned keeping the players informed during the off season. Does that approach, is that the approach you're going to take in season or do you need more buy-in for them while they're actually sort of going through the schedule? I mean, the, I think that's just consistent with our organizational philosophy in particular Ross's leadership style is that, you know, we're not, we're not conducting this as a, you know, dictatorial environment, you know, we're involving them and talking to them. Um, it's really difficult. Like the players have to focus on preparation and playing uh, and taking care of their families. So we're not sitting down, laying out all the variables and all the alternatives and all the cases, but we are making sure <clears throat> that they are comfortable. If they have concerns, we're working to address their concerns. And <clears throat> probably most importantly, Laura, we're making sure they're informed and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. And next is Rash Madani. Uh, good morning, Mark. Hi, Rash. You don't want um, me to see you, huh? Yeah, exactly. You don't want to see me either. <laughs> um, I'm, question about vaccines. What kind of conversations at the team level and league level have there been about vaccinating players? Probably the, 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 the overall message point from MLB and at the team level is that there'll be no um, you know, no effort made by either the league or an individual team to jump ahead. Um, so I think public health information, both locally here in Florida, 
Um, and obviously back in Canada, you know, you'll be as informed as we are uh, when we get access to the vaccine. <clears throat> we feel uh, Major League Baseball has some reason to believe to be optimistic that that's going to happen here uh, sometime this spring. Um, and certainly we will encourage, you know, not just our players, but all support staff that are in tier one and tier two around our team uh, to take the vaccine to ensure a safe environment as possible. And I think that is our fastest path probably back to to playing in Toronto as well. So um, but but again, we don't have information or access and we're not going to jump over uh, anyone that's prioritized above our players. Gotcha. Thanks, man. Yeah. Back to Scott. Um, bear with me here because I'm bad at math, but just looking at the numbers of, of what you guys did with 15% in Dunedin and what, what the Phillies are doing, did you guys decide consciously to go under the max allowed um, for, for capacity fans? We decided it's not just numbers, Scott. It's not strict percentages. It's also spacing. So, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's, a, it's not a formula where you just take a percentage and say, and the same thing we, when we've looked at, how do we safely – put numbers in Rogers center, right? You're not, you're not looking at percentage. You're looking at, you know, what does that specific venue offer as far as how do we safely set up fans with spacing? So it's a combination of a percentage and what the facility looks like. Could you have gone more or is that still? I think we went to the number we felt was safest. Okay. And, and then just one on, cause knowing you're, you're involved with the competition committee, what are your thoughts on the deadening of the baseballs this year? How do you affect, uh, expect that to, to affect gameplay? Yeah, it's not really a deadening of the baseball. It's a move within the previous, you know, it's a, it's a move towards a little bit less live baseball within the already outlined, you know, specs of the ball. Uh, but really what it's meant to do is kind of ensure there's more um, conformity and regularity to the baseball. Um, so, I think, it, you know, based on everything we've been told, it's, you know, one to two feet for, you know, difference for 360 foot, a ball that's hit 360 feet. I don't think that's going to have a drastic, uh, you know, except for maybe a little more uniformity. Um, I don't think it's going to have a drastic impact, but, uh, you know, we certainly are going to do what we always do, which is, you know, see what happens and certainly have the ability to adjust. In my mind, the most important thing for us to do as an industry is to continue to be flexible and open and, you know, adapt, you know, as we get information and not be of so averse to any change that we immediately feel like there's a reflex reaction that change is bad because we're trying to, to make the game a better game for our fans, most importantly, um, and one that's more attractive. And, and, and in that case, it's, you know, could that result in a, in a more fair, um, you know, uh, outcome and result. Thank you. Hey, you're up, Mark. Hey, Mark, I had another math question for you. Um, I'm a history major. That's not a good thing for me. I know. I'm a, I'm a sports <laughs> writer, so we're on equally bad footing here. Um, roughly how many people are going to stay in Dunedin now? I mean, obviously, 26 active players. You've probably got, you know, nine or ten coaches, trainers, you think it's 100 people? You think it's 200 people? I mean, yourself? I mean, how many how many extra people will be staying? I actually, I actually cannot give you that except to tell you, Mark, we've got a much smaller footprint here than we normally bring. Like, I think we brought down maybe a third of the staff that we normally bring down. You know, we did, we brought down a bare bones operation. You know, our, our camp is what our camp is. That number will grow uh, when our minor leaguers come in and they're not here right now. So, um, you know, certainly once we have minor league camp up and running, we'll have a much bigger presence than we normally have here in April, without a doubt. But the number of people we've got around our team is our normal major league traveling party. Uh, and then what we would deem to be essential front office, along with some uh, business front office that's going to help that are going to help us, you know, produce the game, you know, in, in our Dunedin facility. Right. In terms of like your signage and music and yeah, game, in-game entertainment, scoreboard, um, even some help with with the uh, the ticketing. You know, we're just not used to running, you know, a bigger operation here during the season. And and related to that, how will you? I, I know you can't. We can't play scientists. We can't play government official. And now you probably have to play meteorologist too. What, what in your mind is kind of the cutoff? Is what are you telling the players? Like maybe through May before you would try to go to Buffalo, or mid-May, or. 
Yeah, I mean, I think you you haven't been around me long enough. You actually have been around me long enough, not regularly to know that I don't I don't deal with absolutes. I you know I, I recognize how gray the world is, but I think if we were to sit here and say what is an optimal date for us to consider you know, a move, I think you know in early June, you know, at some point we probably want to think about, as you know from from being a resident down here, uh, without climate control in a major league setting. Uh, it's probably not optimal. That doesn't mean we won't stay longer if we think there's an opportunity to get back to Toronto right. uh, with, without a second move. There's a chance we could stay longer. And that, so if that's within reach, um, and I, I would get back to saying the same thing I said at the outset, which is, you know, some combination of Dunedin, Buffalo and Toronto uh, is likely how we're approaching the season with flexibility, um, certainly factoring public health and what's best for competitiveness in our players uh, as being the, the main drivers of those decisions. Cool. Thanks again. Yeah. Yeah. Our last one here is Mike. Mark, uh, the vaccines give us the light at the end of this long tunnel, but given pandemic and all the protocols involved, how much do major league teams worry about how feasible it is to have a minor league season? And I mean, how desperate are you guys to have one? Just, you don't want the alternate site model and your lower level guys didn't play at all. Desperate probably wouldn't be, you know, the right word that I would use, at least, you know, I think we, I'm a player development guy, Mike, as you know, from, from knowing me for decades. Um, and for us not to have been able to provide, you know, an outlet for both development uh, and playing the game for, you know, so many minor leaguers last year was Difficult from a business perspective, but I think every single person that works in this game has recognized that we're not in normal circumstances and that we are going to defer uh, when conducting our business presents a risk, you know, for other people that we are going to defer and we are going to put things on hold. Now, I think we have enough experience with both protocols and enough optimism for progress that we can plan for the return to a form of minor league baseball, albeit somewhat shorter, albeit with protocols and, and very different circumstances and, you know, limited numbers of fans, um, we can plan a return to minor league baseball. And that's largely based upon the information we have learned um, living like this for almost one full year at this point. And just one point of clarity, just to confirm, if at some point you were to come to Buffalo, you would you would be selling tickets as per the New York state regulations and thus have to do some different things in that concourse because you would have fans around the ballpark, right? Yeah. Again, I think that is the plan, but we will certainly not just move forward in that plan without involving local health authorities, you know, Erie County, the city of Buffalo, you know, those in the state of New York. So uh, we're not going to unilaterally make that decision, Mike, to sell tickets in Buffalo, but the plan would be that, you know, I think you'll be able to see what the Yankees and the Mets are doing and, you know, what other minor league teams are doing, and you'll get a good idea of what we'll be doing in Buffalo.